What time is it? It's time for the award-winning Personal Computer Show. Today is July the 8th, 2020. I'm Hank Key, and my colleague is Joe King. Do you know who has your personal data? Do you know how Facebook, Google, Amazon, and other big tech companies are using your personal data? Our website is pcradioshow.org. We are heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, streaming on the Internet. Podcasts of the program is available on prn.fm, on the Internet, as well as pcradioshow.org. To listen to the live program on the telephone each Wednesday, it's 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and the number is 641-793-7091. You can leave me a message with your question or comment at hank at pcradioshow.org. The 2019 income tax filing and payment deadlines for all taxpayers who file and pay their federal income taxes on April the 15th of this year was automatically extended until July 15th. The time has now come. Next Wednesday is July 15th. And for those who can't file by then, the IRS reminds individual taxpayers that everyone is eligible to request an extension to file their return at a later date. If you're self-employed, you ordinarily must pay your income and self-employment taxes to the IRS in advance by making estimated tax payments. These are due four times per year. The first estimated tax payment for 2020 was due April the 15th. The April 15th estimated tax payment had also been delayed by 90 days as well. If you owe money, look at the bright side of it. You have had the use of government money interest-free. Of course, the corollary is that if you have a refund, the government had had the use of your money interest-free. YouTube TV jacks up its prices, and the promise of cheap TV feels, well, further away. YouTube TV is going to cost you $15 more a month beginning July the 30th. For the last three years, YouTube TV has been the affordable alternative to pricier live TV streaming services such as Hulu and AT&T TV. But that price gap just vanished. YouTube TV is jumping from $50 a month to $65 a month due to the rising cost of content. You'll get eight new channels for your money. That's if you really want it. And if you don't want it, it's still going to cost you $15 more a month. BET, CMT, Comedy Central, MTV, Nickelodeon, Paramount Network, TV Land, and VH1. And they promise six more coming later this year for a total of 85 plus channels to watch. But what they have forgotten is that a regular TV viewer watches no more than four to six channels at any time during the month. And that's what they really watch. So, I think that YouTube is making a big mistake. But this isn't exactly the cord-cutting utopia that you had envisioned. It's not a world in which you could ditch the expensive cable TV package and pick and choose the channels you wanted for a much lower monthly price. It once felt that way, though. Each service offered different bundles of channels so you could decide which to subscribe to based on what you wanted to watch. Now what appears to be happening, Fast Company noted last summer, is that media company mergers are forcing streaming TV services to add channels, including ones that many people might not want, and raising their prices in the process. So you have to pay more for a subscription bloated with options, with no choice to ditch the channels that you don't want to see. Kind of sounds like cable, right? YouTube TV Vice President of Product Management acknowledged that the price hike that some subscribers might want more affordable like a la carte options. Well, this is what he said. As the streaming industry continues to evolve, we are working to build new flexible models for YouTube TV users so we can continue to provide a robust and innovative experience for everyone in your household without the commitment of traditional TV. The new price is comparable to AT&T TV choice package, which includes 90 channels and a free year of HBO Max for $65 a month, and is $10 more than Hulu's 
$55 a month live TV package. It seems like every week a new streaming video service enters the market, and at this point it's, let's see what the competition looks like. But those prices could easily change too. In April of 2019, YouTube TV jumped from $35 a month to $50 a month. Hulu's live TV plan increased by $10 a month last December, and AT&T's choice package was $50 a month, until it too jumped by $15 to the now current $65 a month. By the way, for those who may not know it, YouTube is owned by Google. How soon until every streaming service is $100 a month and we'll all switch back to cable, right? So, what's the point of all this? YouTube is trying to sweeten the deal with a few new features to keep you from jumping ship. In addition to all the new channels you probably won't watch, you can now jump to specific segments in a live TV program, like sporting event, not that there are many right now because of the pandemic, and, well, perhaps maybe one day, or newscasts that you still get free unlimited cloud TV storage space for recording your favorite shows. If that's not enough to make you want to pay more, the good news is that unlike with cable contract, you can always cancel YouTube TV whenever you want out because it's on a month-to-month basis. Or at least now you can on a month-to-month basis. But that too can change. If you're like many TV fans this week, you're going to re-examine your TV streaming choices. YouTube TV, which launched three years ago as a low-cost cable alternative for $35 monthly, chose a pandemic when millions are out of work to announce a 30% price hike to a whopping $65 monthly. The 2020 charge had been $50 monthly. It's still cheaper than most cable packages, which top $100 monthly, and YouTube, which boasts over 2 million subscribers, has an advantage in no additional equipment and hidden fees, which cable is notorious for. But the price hike was much such as a cable-like move that many consumers cried, FOUL! YouTube justified the decision by announcing new channels to the lineup, including MTV and Comedy Central. Many consumers said they didn't want the new channels. Just leave me alone and give me the pricing as it is, please. So what can you do? Well, there is Sling TV. While YouTube TV is now the most expensive offering for streaming cable and local channels, Sling is far and away the cheapest, starting at $30 monthly. And Sling went out of its way this week to let those furious YouTube customers know that there will be no price hikes from Sling through at least August 2021 if you sign up for a one-year service by August 1, 2020. So, let's say you decide to take a good look at it again, and you should, as a savings of $35 monthly, and that's a lot of money. And... That works out to almost $400 yearly difference. So, if you went with Sling, how much are you missing out by not having YouTube TV? How's the interface? How's the lineup? Short answer is Sling TV isn't quite as good as YouTube, but I don't think you're going to care much if you have the particular channels that you normally just watch. It does the job, I hope. And just remember, you cut the cord for a reason. Not to just save money but because you don't want to pay through the nose to get channels that you'll never watch and the streaming experience was better. Start watching on the TV. Finish on the phone, tablet, or computer. A less cumbersome DVR that's one-click setup. And since YouTube is owned by Google and has followed your every move, it knows what your viewing taste is and could make some good recommendations. But you know what? For that extra $35 a month, I don't think you need Google's recommendation. I think you can figure out what to watch, right? Sling's lineup isn't as robust as YouTube's with 50 channels to the almost 90 from YouTube. If you're a sports fan, there are way more regional sporting networks you may crave on YouTube. Sling does have some sports as well, along with ESPN, but you have to be careful when you order. There's a blue package, which you can sign up for, and it doesn't have ESPN channels, For them, you need the orange package. Both are $30 separately or $45 for the combo. 
Like YouTube, Sling lets you sort the channels to only display your favorites. Use a program guide to find stuff to watch, or just watch the shows you've recorded. Or you can pay an extra $5 for the DVR service. The TV interface allows you to watch via Apple TV streaming box and is interchangeable with the mobile app or viewing on your computer. Sling's program guide is better than the YouTube guide in that it can show you the lineup for seven days at a glance, while YouTube is only a day a time. YouTube said it's updated the guide to seven days at a glance. Sling is at a major disadvantage over both YouTube and rival Hulu with live TV and ATT now, both in offering local channels and networks. To those of you who would miss having CBS, NBC, Fox, and ABC in your lineup, Sling recommends just connecting an antenna. That could work, but you might have some reception issues. There's another solution. CBS or Access has a complete CBS lineup, and it costs $6 monthly. NBC's new streamer, Peacock, launching soon, will have much of the NBC lineup, but if shows are missing, you can sign up for a premium version for $5 monthly, and for your ABC and Fox fix, the standalone Hulu streaming service has those shows along with NBC for $6 monthly. Total cost, $48, and if you like to, add Cloud DVR and you will add another $5, and that will get you up to $53. That's $12 less monthly than YouTube, or a savings of $144 yearly. It's, however, it's getting more complicated way of beginning about it, but it is one option. The better one, of course, is to vote with your wallet and cancel YouTube TV. If you don't fight back against the price increases and this nasty TV habit of throwing all these channels at us that we don't want, prices will only keep going up and up and up. In making an announcement, YouTube actually made it easy for fans to show their disgust for the move by including the link to cancel or pause the subscription. Are you with me on that, TV fans? Presenting Benjamin Rockwell on his continuing IT Pro series. This week he will discuss usage of social media in business. This is Benjamin Rockwell, and now it's time to get professional. This is where I give you my tidbits of my current and past experience of being in IT for 30 years. One of the biggest things that we've seen over the course of the past few decades is a complete and total evolution in how people think about technology. We have seen a complete turnaround Let's look back at 30 years ago. 30 years ago, it was a matter of maybe a quarter of the people across the country had a personal computer at home. 30 years ago, we're talking, it wasn't even that high, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, because we're talking about 1990, uh, and we didn't hit the 25% mark until the mid-90s, but, but you've got a rough idea there. We didn't have smartphones. As a matter of fact, back then, we had, we had dial-up. We had, you know, if you were communicating with other computers, we had dial-up, and if you didn't communicate with other computers, it was you picking up the phone and dialing the phone. Uh, but anyways, it, it, things have changed. We have all started to embrace our smartphones, our ability to communicate via computers over the internet with things like Facebook, with Twitter, with Instagram, with all of these different social media companies out there, and I can list a number of them. I don't want to because it gets rather boring for me to just list off a laundry list of all of the different social media companies that are out there. However, I want to focus on social media for just a few minutes here. I want to talk about the idea of us using social media in business. And why do we do this? Well, in part, it's advertising. And there is a, there's an age-old adage, and it goes like this. And this is, this is from within the, the 
advertising industry, within the radio and television industry, in the good times, people want to advertise. In the bad times, they have to advertise. And you may not have ever heard of this, but it is very true. It is something that we all have to keep in mind. If we are running a business, if we're taking part in a business, the advertising is key. It's crucial. It's, it's, it's a matter of if you don't put out the word about your company, the few people that do put out the word about your company will control the message of your company. We've seen this in the past. We've seen companies that were not well-versed in social media, were not taking part in social media, and they wound up suffering because somebody else came along, many people came along, and gave them bad Yelp reviews. They gave them bad reviews on this, that, or the other thing, wherever it is, whatever social media aspect it is. However, in business... If you are dealing with social media, you put out your own image, you put out your own message, you put out what you think is important. At a certain point, you're putting out more than that one disgruntled customer. We, we, do, we do dismiss the idea of social media at times, and I do want to warn you if you see social media being involved in business, you know that there are people that are very well versed in the spin doctor aspect of it. They know how to put out the right message. Just like some of those people who take selfies and they post them on Instagram or wherever it is. And we find out later when they admit that, yes, to get to that one perfect picture, I had to take over 200 pictures and I had to suck in my stomach just right, and I had to turn my shoulders just right, and I had to tilt my head just right to make that just look so casual, like it wasn't planned, like it wasn't rehearsed, it wasn't adjusted, manipulated, or whatever. But yeah, social media and business is going to get your message across. It also allows you to communicate with your customers it allows you to make sure that there is a, a two-way road of communication. I will tell you, there are a number of companies out there that constantly monitor and constantly scan the various social media platforms. If you want technical support for your widget, whatever it is, I, I don't care what technical widget it is, you can post online and you go at you know, the at symbol, and then whatever, whoever it is you're dealing with, and you can reach out to them, you're tagging them, you reach out to them, and they can interact with you, and frequently, you'll get faster technical support these days with some companies, not all of them, by just tagging them on your social media platform of choice or multiple social media platforms, especially if it sounds like you've had a difficult time. It's illusionary. It is something that, yes, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You've heard that term before. And they are, they're searching for it to make sure that their public persona is not tarnished. Their public persona doesn't have spray paint all over one side of their building. And that's, that's kind of the balance we're, we're going to be dealing with for a very long time. It can help, social media can help any business, but be forewarned. It can also destroy a business if you don't do it right. It's very powerful. It is one of the biggest driving factors these days to making sure that you get more customers, better customers, and higher profits. This is Benjamin Rockwell. Back to you, Hank. Thank you, Benjamin. Tracking device on your cell phone without your knowledge or consent. A message has been doing the rounds on social media, which goes like this. COVID-19 sensor has been inserted into every phone. If you have an Android phone, go under Settings, then click on Google, Settings, it's there. If you have an iPhone, 
Go to Settings, Privacy, then Health. It's there. I have an Android phone. I know I did not receive notification whether or not I wanted to install a tracing app. I found it was installed without my request. Back in May of this year, Apple and Google announced that they had launched a COVID-19 exposure notifications technology, which allow users to choose whether they want to use COVID-19 tracing apps on their phones. Google and Apple say they want to use COVID-19 tracing apps on their phones. Google and Apple say exposure notification technology is not functional without the user's consent. Privacy advocates are still weighing the pros and cons of proximity tracing apps that use Google and Apple's technology. What they did was highly irregular. They should ask first if you want it installed instead of installing it without notification. There was no notification request on my part. While one may want to launch into a diatribe on Big Brother in Silicon Valley, the truth is far more disappointing. Google and Apple lack complete transparency. If it was needed and I as the owner consented, that's one thing. They're assuming installed whether or not I agree. Did Google and Apple put a COVID-19 tracking app on your phone? Here's the truth. It was uploaded onto your phone and you may not even know it. It's not an app, they say. It's the framework within the operating system that will allow such an app to function once it becomes available if you decide to install it. Hey, wait a minute. Like saying you put a program in there and it could be a virus, it could be ransomware, but if it's not started up, then they really didn't install an app, right? No, the app was installed. It follows the statement from Google and Apple that was released in May of this year. One of the most effective techniques that public health officials have used during outbreaks is called contact tracing. Through this approach, public health officials contact, test, treat, and advise people who may have been exposed to an affected person. One new element of contact tracing is exposure notifications. Using privacy-preserving digital technology to tell someone they may have been exposed to the virus. Exposure notification has the specific goal of rapid notification, which is especially important to slowing the spread of the disease with a virus that can be spread asymptomatically. To help, Apple and Google cooperated to build exposure notifications technology that will enable apps created by public health officials to work more accurately, reliably, and effectively across both Android phones and iPhones. Over the last several weeks, our two companies have worked together, reaching out to public health officials, scientists, privacy groups, and government leaders all over the world to get their input and guidance. Our technology is designed to make these apps work better. Each user gets to decide whether or not to opt in to exposure notifications. The system does not collect or use the location from the device. And if a person is diagnosed with COVID-19, it is up to them whether or not to report that in the public health app. User adoption is key to success, and we believe that these strong privacy protections are also the best way to encourage use of these apps. If data is not collected, then how would they know that they may have contracted COVID-19? Continuing with their release. Today, this technology is in the hands of public health officials across the world who will take the lead and we will continue to support their efforts. Back in April of this year, it was announced that Apple and Google partner on COVID-19 contact tracing. Across the world, governments and health authorities are working together to find solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic to protect people and get society back up and running. Software developers are contributing by crafting technical tools to help combat the virus and save lives. I originally did not give it much thought, but now I find out it has been installed onto my phone and other iPhones and Android phones without prior knowledge or consent of the owner. Apple and Google called what was inserted into your phone a framework, not an app, because it sits there and it's not executing. It is a piece of executable code. Calling it just a framework is an insult to our intelligence. If it's not an app or program, why was it added to the phone without owner notification? This whole thing is absolute BS. 
They know what BS stands for. How is this any different from someone planting a wiretap on my phone without my knowledge? To top it off, there has been no court order, federal law, nor regulation, nor executive order to do this. They just say they're cooperating with government agencies. Alabama, North Dakota, and South Carolina were the first states to commit to using the technology. To our listeners, I hope you are as upset as I am. Notify your elected officials. Let them know this is not acceptable. Big Tech testifying at congressional hearings tell us they are most concerned about data privacy issues. Those are just empty words. Big Tech has been disingenuous pushing for federal privacy law as long as it doesn't affect their business operations in any way. I don't trust Google, Apple, or any government agency. At first, this will be used for tracking COVID-19, and then what's to prevent them from using this to invade our privacy on other issues? What will Google do in the coming months with their cash reserve of $110 billion? Yes, that's with a capital B, billion. $110 billion. The trillion dollar market cap big tech companies are Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and Google. With Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon, their business plans and acquisitions all fit into their long game for growth and expansion. Google, on the other hand, since February 2001, made 234 company acquisitions. They are on a pace of acquiring a company every two weeks. Google has to have an idea of what to do with all the things it has bought over the years, right? Google has a tech addiction with a drawer filled with all the things it has bought, but most of it never used except sit in a drawer filled with corporate ownership papers instead of boxes and cables. Looking back at Google's recent purchases, HTC Hardware Engineers, Next, Motorola, Fitbit, Bits and Pieces of Fossil, and now North. Google has shelled out billions for these acquisitions, and we've not seen much change on the consumer-facing side of it. Some of these acquisitions made perfect sense, like buying Motorola's hardware division and smartphone-based patent portfolio. But a look at what exactly Google now owns and a little thought about what Google sees as the future of computing and the Internet can help us piece together Google's strategy. And that is an entire ecosystem of mobile, wearable, and smart home products that are so good people want to buy them. When you have billions to spend, you can play the long game. Google has more than a nameplate from these purchases. It has what is most important, ideas and people who can make them a reality. Google needs to make the next step happen itself instead of depending on partners, and it has the pieces to do it. Android is a bigger success than even Google anticipated because of hardware partners. According to IDC, Apple makes around 15% of the world's smartphones, and companies that use Android makes up the rest. That's a lot of Google in a lot of hands. But because the market is so one-sided, Google has to play by special rules or end up in court for abusing its dominance. And Google almost certainly doesn't like how it has to operate when it comes to smartphones. Google needs to get the right people with the right ideas if it wants to succeed under its own brand. In the case of smartphones, Google depended on companies like Samsung, to distribute their great idea. The problem is that Google is really good at writing software to do just about anything once initial bugs are ironed out, but so many other companies are better at building hardware. Google has to get good at building things or let other companies help decide how it's going to happen. Look again at the companies Google has purchased. There is Google Glass 2 and Pixel Watch, and they are almost certainly going to happen. But more importantly, your next smart and connected home is going to be built from Google's own products. Smart Wi-Fi, smart locks, smart lighting, smart window blinds, garage door openers, washing machines, refrigerators, you name it. Every appliance or other mundane thing you own can be made better 
if it is automated in some fashion, and Google Assistant is a platform that can bring everything together in the big pictures. It is certain to happen. With all these products, Google, like Apple, is going to start building its own chips. Google isn't like someone who wins the lottery and is broke in a year. Financial experts work with all branches of the company to buy exactly what Google thinks it needs to be even more successful. Google isn't dumb, and it's playing the long game. Let's look at some of their key acquisitions. By buying Android from Andy Rubin back in August of 2005, Google has successfully developed Android to become the leading operating system in the smartphone world and a global market share of more than 80%. Even better, Google has had the intelligence to perfectly integrate all its tools within Android. Initially, this strategy allowed Google to impose the use of its services and applications. The Google Play Store, YouTube, Google Maps, and Gmail have become essential for most Android smartphone owners. Secondly, it's allowed Google to impose its law on Android smartphone manufacturers. Indeed, even if Android is an open-source mobile operating system, it loses much of its value if the famous Google Play services are not made available to the end user. However, to be able to use these Google Play services, smartphone manufacturers must obtain the famous Android license issued by Google. To obtain it, you must comply strictly with the rules laid down by Google, including a mandatory emphasis on Google applications and services. All this allows Google to generate even more revenue with Android. However, Google must be careful because the European Union now seems concerned about what would look very much like an abuse of a dominant position. And it is a dominant position. Sanctions have already been imposed on Google, and it's not impossible in the future that Google will have to change the way it operates when it systemically promotes its other products on Android. This necessarily reminds us of Microsoft, which had to stop offering only Internet Explorer by default on its Windows operating system at the end of the 1990s, as an example. In October 2006, Google announced that it had acquired the video sharing site YouTube for $1.65 billion in Google stock, and the deal was finalized in November 13th of 2006. At the time this happened, this amount was seen excessive for some But when now you look back at it, what Google has managed to do with YouTube, you think it was a very good price. Today, the platform approaches 2 billion active monthly users while representing more than 6% of Alphabet's revenues. That's Google's parent company. We often wonder what is more important between an idea and its implementation. In the case of YouTube, Google has clearly shown that implementation is often more important than the idea itself. On April 13, 2007, Google reached an agreement to acquire DoubleClick for $3.1 billion, transferring to Google valuable relationships that DoubleClick had with web publishers and advertising agencies. The deal was approved despite antitrust concerns raised by its competitors Microsoft and AT&T. DoubleClick was acquired in April of 2007 for $3.1 billion before being integrated into AdSense. Google's in-house solution. The idea here was to kill a competitor before it became too powerful. This strategy is not new, but it has once again proved it worth for Google, which has thus been able to strengthen AdSense's dominant position in this market. In November of 2009, Google finally acquired AdMob for $750 million. By 2019, Google is the leader in mobile advertising with AdMob, and the leader in online computer advertising. DoubleClick and AdMob have therefore proved to be excellent acquisitions from Google. More than ever, they now are the leader in the world of online advertising. Google knows full well that the phenomenal success of smartphones to come with iOS or Android will make advertising on smartphones a huge market. Google is therefore looking for AdMob an extremely promising company in the world of mobile advertising. On August the 15th, 2011, 
Google made its largest ever acquisition to date when it announced that it would acquire Motorola Mobility for $12.5 billion, subject to the approval from regulators in the United States and Europe. This purchase was made in part to help Google gain Motorola's considerable patent portfolio on mobile phones and wireless technologies to help protect Google in its ongoing patent disputes with other companies, mainly Apple and Microsoft, and to allow it to continue to freely offer Android. The merger was completed in May 22, 2012, after the approval from China. Google's $12.5 billion acquisition of Motorola Mobility in 2011 remained the largest in its history, but it is a semi-failure for Google. Indeed, if this acquisition has allowed Google to strengthen Android's position by recovering Motorola's very substantial patent portfolio in mobile, it would have been great, but it ended with a resale to Lenovo for just $2.91 billion at the beginning of 2014. In June of 2013, Motorola acquired Waze, that's W-A-Z-E, for $966 million. While Waze would remain an independent entity, its social features such as crowdsource location platform were reportedly valuable integrations between Waze and Google Maps, Google's own mapping service. Google acquired the mobile GPS navigation application Waze, which is based on user-definable mapping. Waze remains a standalone application on Android and iOS, but Google uses the application's data to improve the real-time content offered by Google Maps. Another great acquisition for Google, which has continued to develop Waze in recent years to the point of making it the leader in mobile GPS navigation applications. Even better, the content generated for free by users in the Waze community benefits Google Maps service. On January 26, 2014, Google announced it had agreed to acquire DeepMind Technologies, a privately held artificial intelligence company from London. DeepMind describes itself as having the ability to combine the best techniques from machine learning and systems neuroscience to build general-purpose learning algorithms. DeepMind's first commercial applications were used in simulations, e-commerce, and games. As of December 2013, it has reported that DeepMind has roughly 75 employees. Technology news website Recode reported that the company was purchased for $400 million, though it's not disclosed where the information came from. A Google spokesperson would not comment on the price. The purchase of DeepMind aids in Google's recent growth in the artificial intelligence and robotics community. The acquisition of Nest in 2014 for $3.2 billion was needed to become a player in the world of home automation. Nevertheless, the purchase has not yet borne fruit yet, but in 2017, Google chose to strengthen its skills as a smartphone manufacturer by acquiring HTC's Pixel phone division for $1.1 billion. This operation allows Google to produce its own Pixel smartphones, which are intended to be references in terms of best practices for smartphone running Android OS. Not all acquisitions by Google have been hits, but the few big hits it has had more than made up for all the purchases it made. It's still hard to grasp the fact that they've been buying a technical company every two weeks. So what can we expect Google's next steps? The next major acquisition of Google will most likely be in the cloud world. Several analysts claim that Google had views on Twitter or Snapchat. However, this has never been achieved so far. In 2018, Google tried to buy major companies in the open source world. Thus, Google entered the dance for the acquisition of GitHub and then Red Hat, which would have opened many additional opportunities in the cloud. In the end, Google was defeated respectively by Microsoft, which bought GitHub for $7.5 billion, and by IBM, which bought Red Hat for $34 billion. Google's failure to buy Red Hat is particularly damaging because it would have allowed Google to significantly improve its Google Cloud Platform offer. It wouldn't have been luxury because in the cloud, Google is still behind Microsoft and its Azure solution, and even further behind Amazon in its Amazon Web Services. And everyone knows 
that it's not good to be the third player in the technology field, which is what Google is at in the cloud services. Google is looking to make major acquisitions in the coming months to bolster its cloud computing business. To do this, Google will rely on its cash reserve of $110 billion in cash flow. In June of 2019, Google acquired Looker, a data analytics startup, confirming the trend of a strong strengthening of the company in the cloud world. However, it seems clear that this acquisition is just the beginning for Google, which is expected to make bigger acquisitions in the cloud world in the coming months. Google's potential targets are not clearly identified, although some talk of internet in acquiring Salesforce.com to beat Amazon in the cloud world. We will follow in the coming months as to what Google will do as one thing seems certain. The next major acquisition of Google will definitely be in the cloud world. Presenting Marty Winston with his all hands on tech. Marty explains how electrostatics and ions and plasma can often add up to snake oil or what he calls the no zone of ozone. And in some cases, get tamed and make things healthier. If I say the word electrostatic, does anything come to mind? How about wintertime sparks from your fingertip to the doorknob? Or rubbing balloons to stick them to the walls? Maybe it's lightning. Or those round lamps that look like, oh, and sometimes are, science fiction props. Old hi-fi buffs may remember when electrostatic speakers were all the rage. Sharper Image had a product called Ionic Breeze. It used electrostatics to make the air smell better. Did you notice anything in common among all those things? If you did, you're pretty good, because there isn't much. For that matter, today's electrostatic products often dodge that word and instead use words like ionic or plasma. Ho hum. Is this another trip to the snake oil gusher? Well, it can be, but you can dodge that. Imagine there are, oh, I don't know, a million products out there that claim to use electrostatic or ionic or plasma physics to get some kind of something done, usually some kind of cleaning. And while you're imagining that, embrace this. Many to most of them are bogus. Some of them are irrefutably dangerous. But there are a very few that can do enough good to make hearing about the whole stinking category worthwhile. It's a balance, but it's so out of whack, it's wacky. When you hear the word electrostatic, it's okay to think of static electricity, and it's okay to think of high voltages. When you generate a high voltage, it doesn't take very much current at all, almost no amperage, so almost no power to make a few things happen. And it's the mix of those things that make this worth understanding. We're talking about DC voltages. So there's a plus and a minus, just like on a battery. When you can maintain a high voltage without letting sparks fly or baby lightning bolts zap around, the areas around those plus and minus points, in fact, they're not just areas, but volumes, and it's okay to think of them as invisible bubbles or clouds that get involved in that plus or that minus, the air itself gets charged. The things in the air, even microscopic things, get charged. If you ever took a physics class, you may remember that when you charge molecules like the nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and carbon dioxide in the air, well, some of those molecules gain electrons, and electrons are negative or minus. So that makes those molecules more minus, and they're in the minus or negatively charged zone. Easy enough. Some of the molecules lose electrons, which makes them less minus. So they're in the positive zone. There's a name for molecules with their electrons out of balance. They're called ions. You know, like that old ionic breeze. So the word ion in a name mostly just means electrostatically charged. And if you hear the word plasma, somebody is calling those electrostatically charged gases plasmas. They really aren't plasmas. Real plasmas are a lot more spread out, but you will hear the name being used. 
Enough of the name, gang. Let's get back to the areas with all those high-voltage-induced electrostatic charges in them. So far, so good? Crank up the voltage, and you get a little more drama out of all of this. The oxygen in the air starts breaking up and recombining. Ionic oxygen has a name. It's called ozone. And ozone has a name. Health hazard. If you get a chance, Google ozone and health. There's been a lot of fake science trying to peddle ozone as something that sanitizes or kills germs or freshens air or is good for you. In each case, the opposite is true. If you'd like a good scare, look up what the CDC has to say about ozone. So what was up with that? Simple. It's really easy to create high voltages. The Model T Ford had a coil gizmo that used a battery and a buzzer to make the high voltage for its spark plugs. Old TV sets with picture tubes all needed high voltages to drive them. And quick buck artists had very little problem at all building products that used high voltage for really no purpose at all other than creating ozone. Ozone that they convinced a lot of people was a huge boon to health. That has never been true. The most relaxed of federal guidelines sets ozone limits at 100 parts per billion. That's with a B, billion, never, never to be exceeded. But you know what? If you keep that high voltage under 6,300 volts, you don't have to remember that, but you need to know there's a limit. If you keep that high voltage under 6,300 volts, you will not generate ozone. Okay, high voltage, no ozone. What good is that? Is there some reason you want to have a bubble of charged air? Oh yeah, more than a bubble. A bubble that extends through your ventilation ducts and out into every room they reach. Think about that. Air that's electrostatically charged. Carrying dust that's electrostatically charged. And droplets and microscopic stuff, some of it alive. And viruses that hitchhike on dust and droplets. You know what isn't electrostatically charged? The room. Its walls, pictures, windows, display screens, furniture, those are all electrostatically neutral. Remember how rubbing a balloon gets it to stick to a wall? That balloon is charged. The wall isn't. It's neutral. Charged particles are attracted to neutral things. So, the charged dust and pollen and microorganisms in the air will be eager to land on furniture and surfaces. And charged things are even more strongly attracted to oppositely charged things. You knew that. So what happens if you can put a little gizmo in your ventilation ducts that continually charges the air, starting in there, in those ducts, and blowing out into the rest of the house? Little oppositely charged things in the air clump together. That makes them a little bigger and a little heavier. Bigger and heavier enough that when they come into a room with those neutral surfaces, walls and furniture and floors and so on, they get drawn into those even faster. That draws them out of where you inhale and onto places you only reach by touching. Some of it will even get sucked back into the air returns, and that will be the last you see of that stuff, because they're now bigger and heavier enough to get trapped by your HVAC system's air filter. And it's not just the things that blow through the duct registers. If somebody in the room coughs, those droplets are spraying into charged air, where they'll pick up the charges and pretty quickly get pulled out of breathing space and onto surfaces, or sucked into the air returns. They may still expose others. Yes, they may. But the exposure reach and duration will both be cut short. But notice, there's no death ray here. Electrostatic products don't kill viruses or bacteria or other microorganisms. They will help filters trap more of them. They will help take more of them out of the air. They won't kill them. My own plan, a little complex, is to add both UVC disinfecting germicidal lights and an electrostatic device, both of those, to the HVAC's air return. So that will kill and cluster as much as possible just before the air gets to the filter. And possibly after the filter, put another electrostatic unit on the other side in the air handler to make sure the charged air bubbles that get out into the room retain a lot of potency. 
Well, that should be enough to address allergens, odors, and smoke, not just the microorganisms. Two vendors. Two vendors have been invited to send their products here for editorial reviews. One is Phenomenal Air, air with an E at the end, and the other is iWave. They're both pretty similar, they're both effective, and there are HVAC guys out there who will swear that nothing is better than one or another. It's like picking teams for uh, the Super Bowl. By the way, doing all of these things to your HVAC gets extremely easy to cost justify if there's anybody in your house who suffers especially bad allergies. You also want to know that when you first add an electrostatic air treatment, well, for the first several weeks anyway, it will look like your house just went through a dust blizzard. You could end up vacuuming and dusting three times as often. After that initial period, it all settles down to normal. And no, it's probably not worth buying yourself a feather duster in one of those naughty French maid costumes. Next time, instead of talking about still more things you can add to your HVAC system, we'll get into some frequently recommended add-ons that you might be a lot smarter to skip. Yes, some HVAC improvements, so-called improvements, raise suspicions. Join us next time and learn which way the wind is really blowing for them and for you. Thank you, Marty. Public service announcements. Computer club meetings in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut tri-state region. Some of the computer clubs have begun to schedule their general meetings through teleconferencing. For updated information, visit the website of the computer club. The New York Amateur Computer Club will be meeting Thursday, July 9th. Meeting time is 7 p.m., And the presentation will be Wix Website Builder Techniques, Tools, and Components via Zoom virtual meeting. And the website is nyacc.org for more information. The Brookdale Computer Users Group will be meeting Thursday, July the 23rd. Starting at 6.45 p.m., there will be a presentation on a tutorial on Google Docs via Zoom virtual meeting. And their website is bcug.com for more information. The Princeton PC Users Group will be meeting Tuesday, July the 28th. Meeting time is 7 p.m. via Zoom virtual meeting, and their website is ppcug-nj.org for more information. And the Amateur Computer Group of New Jersey will start up in September 11th, that's a Friday, at 8 p.m. via Amazon Chime. Visit their website, acgnj.org, for more information. Our website is pcradioshow.org. We are heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, streaming on the Internet. Podcasts of the program is available on prn.fm on the Internet. If you have any questions for us, just send me an email addressed to hank at pcradioshow.org. In the meantime, stay in touch and remember to do your regular backups on your computer. I'm Hank Key, and on behalf of Joe King, Michael Horowitz, Marty Winston, and Benjamin Rockwell, we thank you for your support. Stay safe and healthy until we meet again, same time, same station, next week.